Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today on the podcast, we're going to be speaking about martyrdom. And I thought this would be a really interesting phenomenon to explore, both in terms of the, uh, the sort of official meaning of that word. You know, throughout history, there have been religious martyrs, there have been political martyrs. Uh, we hear about them in the news, but of course, there's also the colloquial meaning of the word. And we probably all know someone <laughs> that irritates us that we think of as a martyr. So we thought we'd explore both of those topics today, maybe see how they're interrelated and see how they're different. And before we jump into the podcast, I do just want to remind listeners about Dream School. Uh, we have a 12-month online program that helps you learn how to work with your dreams much the same way that we work with dreams on the podcast. So if you want to Take a look at that and all that we have to offer there. You can go to our website, thisunionlife.com, and check out Dream School. So, on the topic, martyrdom, what do we think? Well, I think having been raised Catholic <laughs> myself, that... Uh, you get to go first. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, if, it's funny for us to be talking about it because it's a word that was around uh, often enough being raised Catholic and in a certain sense without a lot of charge. Mm. It's like, oh, the martyring of this saint and the martyring of that saint and that it had a, an oddly ordinary huh. quality to it. And I think that as a kid, it wasn't really unpacked in any great way, although the pictures and yeah. depictions were pretty gory. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> That it seemed like, oh, you know, that's yeah. a thing, you know, that's the thing that the early Christians did. So I, I think that, and then titrated into a, a much more homey and homely sense, was just that there's value in suffering. Mm. And that in order to be a Catholic, mm. in order to be a disciple, that one has to be prepared for a certain degree of suffering. And on one level, I think, um, for me being raised in a really uh, violent and dangerous home on a personal level, it afforded me some kind of frame to sublimate some yeah. of my own suffering, that there was some kind of a religious meaning even to the childhood mm. trauma that was going on. And I think that that had a certain strangely protective mm. component to it. Not that I would advocate for such a thing, for anyone to be exposed to that, but it provided a frame of meaning to <laughs> something that one could easily have thought of as meaningless. When I think about Viktor Frankl and his horrific suffering in the concentration camps, that to afford oneself a frame of meaning, and with martyrdom, a frame of archetypal meaning, it does mm -hmm. allow something to remain structured in an environment that is inherently annihilating. Mm. Wow, Joseph, mm. that really just opened up this topic so beautifully and poignantly. I, I, love, I love what you said that sort of one of the main ideas is there could be value in suffering. Suffering could be transformed mm. or, or, or in service to something greater. And, and, that's, and that's true, right? Like that's just fundamentally true that, and we know this as analysts, that, that uh, you know, we, we often see people in anguish in our practices 
And part of the space we hold is that their suffering could have meaning and it could be in the interest of soul making. Yeah. And that the, the martyr is in some way is su- subtly and often unconsciously, particularly as a child, identified with the suffering God. And mm-hmm. so there's a way in which God takes part of the suffering away from us um, in the idea that there is a co-suffering. It's a very, it sounds like strange mental gymnastics, but as a child, it made sense to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, weren't al- you weren't the only one who suffered. No, not at all. Others and, had suffered too, and they had um, transcended their suffering. Yes, in that way, but I have to say that also the, um, the subtle protective inflation. Yes. <laughs> that that the, the suffering God is incarnating in the suffering child or in myself as a suffering mm. child, mm. which then offers a kind of resilience um, and a kind of potency in the face of the pain that's being inflicted, that, um, that, that, again, afforded this resistance to being annihilated. And I think that's one of the great powers of the archetypes, mm-hmm. is that they can distort, but they also can protect us you know, when we are in unimaginable circumstances. And I think also the term of being martyred has become a colloquial term to mean far less dramatic things. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and an excuse perhaps to be self-indulgent even, or to raise an ordinary suffering to an exaggerated level to afford a kind of mm-hmm. inflation that may not be deserved. Well, you know, I, I'm so glad you brought that word up, inflation, because I think that that is... That is probably a concept that applies to both meanings of the word, and we mm-hmm. can maybe sort of slowly unpack that mm-hmm. as we go mm-hmm. today. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really very poignant, you know, what you've, you've said as a child, uh, to, be, to be able to find some meaning in it, um, that after all, you know, there was a suffering God. There was Jesus on the cross uh, giving up his own life for something greater. And that I can imagine that as a child, uh, it, it really helped you uh, to, to feel aligned uh, with, with something greater, that you're, you're enduring and serving something greater. There's a meaning in it. Uh, you know, following in footsteps of of one who sacrificed himself for others, uh, and you, uh, Victor Frankl, who wrote *Man's Search for Meaning*, was um, a Jewish man and a psychologist uh, who was imprisoned in a concentration camp during World War II, uh, and that he too found a way to convert suffering uh, into into meaning. And th- I wonder if that's a litmus test in a way for what constitutes martyrdom is, you know, what is it that a person is really serving? Uh, uh, is it a pointless sacrifice? Um, is it a way to endure? Is it a way to increase consciousness? Uh, is it an interpersonal manipulation? Mm. Uh, what is really being offered up? Well, and I think it's complex because when when you think about the idea of martyrdom, you, you know the the underlying assumption is that somehow there's something greater than us. Mm. There's something greater than the life of the body mm. that uh, matters more, mm. you know? And, and that's a tremendous idea. And it's an idea that very much speaks to 
what Jung called the religious function of the psyche. So he thought that the we we all had a sort of innate urge to be in relationship with something larger than ego. And it was an instinct. The religious function is is one of the basic instincts. And I I I can't see how Jung wasn't right about that. It seems really obvious to me that he pegged that. So th- that that sense that there's something larger than me, and so my individual yeah. life doesn't matter very much. You know, that's that's a that's an incredibly compelling idea. I mean, if 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 the uh, sort of fear of death is a major motivator for most of us, uh. the idea that we could sort of overcome that by making our life be in service to something greater. Uh, is is pretty wildly compelling. Mm-hmm. And so if we think about martyrs, we mentioned the early saints, and I think that, I think they were just mostly martyrs, and they all died in these really tremendously horrific ways. <laughs> oh, is it St. Um, Sebastian that has all the arrows? Arrows, It was yeah. a favorite topic of medieval uh, painters. <laughs> yes, yeah. And of course, you know, there's, let's not forget, you know, Jesus, who who martyred himself, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in service to something larger, he sacrificed himself. Um, I do think that uh, you know I was thinking about what's the difference between the hero who sacrifices himself and the martyr, and I I think there's a difference. I don't know if you guys would agree, but I, you know, my my image of the hero sacrificing himself is the firefighters that went into the burning. Uh, World Trade Center towers on 9/11. Everyone else was trying to get up, trying to get out, and they were going in, mm-hmm. and they all died. And they probably knew they were going to die. Yeah, but they went in to try to save whomever they could. So I don't, I don't know that they would be considered martyrs, but I don't know. What do you think? I don't think so. Um, it, well, in a way, of course, it's in the line of duty. Yes. Um, I was living in New York then, everybody knows there were 343 firefighters who died. And some weeks after uh, 9-11, I was on a subway car, and a firefighter in his full uniform, the dress uniform, not um, firefighting clothes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, got onto the subway car. It still gets me. And... uh, we all stood up. Uh, they had served something greater, a principle mm-hmm. of, of duty and, and rescue. And I, I don't know that anybody knew that the buildings were going to come down. Mm-hmm. Um, they served something greater. But but they didn't. They died in service to helping others, which I think is a little bit different than dying for an idea. I don't. I don't. I don't know that. Um, hmm. I. I. You know. I think they're heroes. Hmm. Um. You know what? Fair enough. Uh, they're heroes. Um. And they died for a principle of service. Yeah. Uh, that this is what they're dedicated to. So they're, but, but I, I get the distinction you're pointing, you're pointing to. Okay. So here's the definition of martyr. So, and I think it, it's helpful to kind of be precise. This is Merriam Webster. Webster. A person who voluntarily suffers death as the penalty of witnessing to and refusing to renounce a religion, mm-hmm. or a person who sacrifices something of great value and especially life itself for the sake of principle. And then the third, the third meaning is the, the one we'll get to later, a great or constant sufferer. <laughs> but interestingly, martyr as a verb is to put to death for adhering to a belief, faith, or profession. So, uh, so I, so I do think it's a, it's, it's a little different. I think, uh, you know, famous martyrs, we've already mentioned some, I have in mind also Thomas More, which I think is, uh, 
sort of an interesting case. And and also, I think one of the things that made me want to talk about this is I was remembering the Buddhist monk who self-immolated in mm. uh, in in Vietnam. And uh, you know, those of us that are of a certain age will remember that photo and how it very quickly changed U.S. policy. But martyrdom has an effect on us uh it, when it is in service it can be ve- to something very powerful a principle or a belief uh a political value uh, it has a powerful effect on us and of course jesus on the cross has had a powerful effect on untold numbers of people. Uh, It's historical in a very major way. It's affected a lot of Western world development and belief. That Buddhist monk uh, had an effect on on policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when we see someone stand up for, sacrifice him or herself, for something greater, uh, it has an impact in the human realm. Well, and and of course, the question is like, what are you in service to? Because exactly. there, there is something about, um, yes, you know, being like being willing to sacrifice yourself to make a point. I'm, I'm thinking also of the um, the the Irish hunger strikers. You know, mm. you're, you're in effect, mm. you're you're. You're trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to be a little uncharitable. You're trying to appeal to empathy, to leverage that in the interest of changing a policy, and mm-hmm. so it's a kind of manipulation. Well, I, I can if, if it has that um, political view to mm-hmm. it, or if we believe that we're being witnessed in such a way that. A larger mass of people are going to be influenced. Um, some martyring happens in a purely private way. Mm-hmm. M- my impulse is to pause for a minute and think about this as a purely intrapsychic moment. Mm-hmm. And and in that way, I think that it can have something to do with individuation, mm-hmm. and something to do with the mortificatio, mm-hmm. which is that alchemical death process. So if we imagine that. At some point in our development, we come into a profound understanding and experience of who and what we truly are, which is we could say as individuation. I know what I know who I am, I know how I am meant to live, I know what my values are, I know what's important to me. And that being situated in a life that does not support that or is not congruent with that, how much are we willing to suffer in order to remain in alignment with our truest self? How much are we willing to let die away, Mm. both in terms of our own personal habits, our ego identifications, our appetites, as well as maybe the relationships, jobs, careers, family, friends that we have accreted around us, how much are we willing to suffer the death of to remain in pure integrity with our truest and perhaps at that point emergent sense of self? Mm -hmm. And can we martyr ourselves to who we have discovered that we truly are? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, in a sense, a decision. To, to be our truest self, whether or not people like it or approve of it, or if we are at dangerous odds with our families, friends, mm-hmm. or our government, and to the greatest extent, with your example of the that Buddhist monk, mm-hmm. to be able to put our bodily integrity, our lives, at stake in order to remain in integrity with who and what we know ourselves to be, 
But there are much lesser martyrings that we go through mm -hmm. in, in various cycles of our lives, and particularly we talk about midlife mm -hmm. crisis, to have everything that we thought or much of what we thought we were mm -hmm. to be martyred or crucified in service to this emergent greater truth of who we are. To me, that seems relevant as well. I'm thinking of this as the, de the degrees and all of the ways in which uh, we can sacrifice ego uh, for, for the sake of what undergirds our conscious personalities, something eternal, uh, that which Jung called the self. Uh, and that we do do this in big and little ways of you mentioned midlife joseph of of what I worked for and extended myself to and uh in the external world in the way of career and achievement and uh accomplishments uh has to be martyred to something something greater, something that is more enduring uh less external world related um, uh, or people who have to leave let's say a marriage of that um, this is there is something greater that demands my personal integrity um, and so this will have to be sacrificed and on the other end of this polarity, of course, sometimes there's a real manipulation that, um, you know, I will do these things in order to have an effect on these people, uh, such as hunger strikers. Um, it's very hard to witness hunger strikers uh, without intervening. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just subtly disagree with you both for a second, because I think... <laughs> you, you can overtly disagree okay, with us okay. if you want. <laughs> well, I think what you described, Joseph, and then you picked up on it, Deb, it's really beautiful, but it might be more of a sacrifice, because I, I think that the idea of the martyr okay. really does contain this idea of kind of an inflation. And usually when we sacrifice, we're not inflated. Mm. In fact, we're deflated. But the, 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 sac the martyr has a sense of kind of doing something uh, that is, you know, often going to be publicly acclaimed, frankly, and, or at least publicly witnessed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a, 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 a so sort of a sense of being very special about it. And I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's interesting because I, I, think, I think about Thomas More, for example, and of course, you know, he was canonized and we probably all read that play in middle school and Man for All Seasons. And, you know, it's kind of, it's hard not to, to, to admire Thomas More. And I, I, I love Tudor history and I, I read and watched. Um, say, a, say a little more about yeah, Thomas will, More. For... So, um, so he, he was... Um, you know, he was around the court. He was an important person in the court of King Henry VIII. And I, I know I'm going to get the details wrong. And so the Tudor historians are going to write in and say that I, I got it wrong. But, um, but, mm -hmm. but in any case, so Henry VIII decided to break with Rome and he was going to become the new head of the Church of England. And so everyone had to kind of, I think it, they had to all swear an oath or sign a statement yes. that they were, you know, now recognized him as the head of the church or something. I probably have that slightly wrong. But anyway, Thomas More said, you know, I can't see how this is more important. I, I can't see how my life is as important as me holding to my principles. And so I will not sign it. And, uh, you know, Henry, I think, sort of begged him to, at least in some of the fictional depictions, you, you kind of get that sense. But he said no, you know, and he was held in the Tower of London and executed. Um, so, and, and then of course later canonized and, uh, you know, you know, the Hillary man tells, uh, Wolf Hall, which is, includes that segment as part of it. You know, she really does her best to make, um, Cromwell look, uh, Cromwell is usually more of the villain, but Cromwell mm -hmm. looks good. And Thomas More looks, uh, you know, kind of, kind mm -hmm. of like a dirt bag, you know, 
<laughs> but but even in even engaging with the Hillary Mantel version, I'm still like, wow, that that's a lot of integrity to say, you know, that, no, I this is what I believe, and you're not, you cannot force me to to refute my beliefs. You cannot force me to deny what matters to me. You know that that's a kind of stunning, astounding position to take when when what's on when what's on. Uh, on the line is your life. You know, another person uh, that 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 comes up for me when I when I think about this is, um, oh my God, what's her name? Um, the what the 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 um, the German girl who it will come to me in a second, who was protesting the Nazis, knowing that she would get caught and killed, oh. and. I still can't come up with her name. But and Frank? No, oh. no, no. Um. Anyway, uh, it'll come to me in a second. But she, you know, she, she, she was twenty years old or something, and she knew she was going to get caught and killed, uh. and she got caught and killed. And she, she didn't, she didn't back down. She, um, you know, the principle mattered more than her life, and that that is a a really. You know, you think most people these days will back down if they're worried about being, uh, you know, slandered on social media or perhaps, you know, not being put up for a promotion. They'll, you know, capitulate on an important belief. So for someone to do what Thomas mm-hmm. Moore did, or I'm going to have to look it up, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it is, it does, it, it is admirable. I'm going back to, um, the etymology around uh, witness as associated with mm-hmm. martyr, that um, <clears throat> martyrs are, are publicly martyred. Yes. Uh, you don't go off into the woods, uh, live in a cabin by yourself, and then, quiet, no. and then quietly immolate yourself. No. You do it in the public square. You do it where it can be witnessed. And where it can inspire other people, mm-hmm. yes, of uh, to make that kind of public statement of this matters more. Yep, that's true, Deb. That's a really good point, Sophie Shaw. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> but you know, you, you're you're very right. It is public. That is a part of being a martyr. Is yes. that other people see it. And I'm wondering, I have a little, um, up on my phone, I have a little uh, um, short description. The photographer who took the picture of the Buddhist monk was named Malcolm Brown. And he talks a little bit about it, which I think goes to your point. So do you mind if I read just a bit of it? Go for it. So um, he, he makes a point of saying that the other correspondents weren't really interested in the Buddhist protesters, but he was. And he said that one you know, one monk in particular would sort of tip him off when something was going to go down. So um, one night he advised me to come to the pagoda at seven the next morning because something very special and important was going to happen. Uh. He sent the same message to half a dozen Uh. other American correspondents, but they all ignored it. I did not. That was all. That morning, a Buddhist monk went out and sat down in a main intersection in downtown Saigon. Two of his fellow monks poured gasoline over him, and he set himself on fire and died. I was there, the only Western correspondent present and taking pictures. It was clearly theater staged by the Buddhists to achieve a certain political end. At the same time, there was a human element to it that was just horrifying because the sequence of pictures showed the initial shock of the flames touching his face and so forth. He never cried out or screamed, but you could see from his expression that he was exposed to intense agony. And then uh, he goes on a bit, but um, he says, um, I've been asked a couple of times whether I could have prevented the suicide. I could not. There was a phalanx of perhaps 200 monks and nuns who were ready to block me if I tried to move. A couple of them chucked themselves under the wheels of a fire truck that arrived. But in the years since, I've had this searing feeling of perhaps having in some way contributed to the death of a kind old man who probably would not have done what he did, nor would the monks in general have done what they did, if they had not been assured of the presence of a newsman 
who could convey the images and experience Mm -hmm. to the outer world. Because if that was the whole point, to produce theater of the horrible so striking that the reasons for the demonstrations would become apparent to everyone. And, of course, they did. The following day, President Kennedy had the photograph on his desk, and he called in Henry Cabot Lodge, who was about to leave for Saigon as U.S. ambassador, and told him, in effect, this sort of thing has got to stop. And that was the beginning of the end of American support for that regime. Mm. So there is, there is a theater element to it. And I think, Joseph, that picks up on your word of inflation. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm not trying to diminish, you know, what that man mm. did. But it's a, it is a, con- a complex uh, psychological phenomenon, I think. It is a call to greater consciousness on the part of witnesses, a call to change, Mm -hmm. a call, uh, it's a protest. Um, And that that takes me back to the firefighters of of 9-11. They they were serving something greater, a, a principle of duty, but there was no element there to to raise consciousness or to see something differently mm-hmm. it, that was uh, human and noble and rescuing and serving other people, unlike uh, the immolation of the monk in Saigon, which is do something, change something, mm-hmm. see this differently, um, you know, or, or Thomas More mm-hmm. uh, of n- no. Uh, there's a principle here. He affected other people Mm -hmm. uh, for greater consciousness, awareness, social change. But, but, you know, the, the the other thing is that martyrdom and zealotry often go hand in hand. And the Mm. other forms of martyrs that we might be familiar with are uh, suicide bombers. And they are, you know, as I understand it, and this is not, you know, um, an area of deep knowledge on my part, but I, I believe that, um, you know, and there are suicide bombers of all stripes from all cultures, but particularly it, uh, when it's inspired in service to uh, the religion of, religion of Islam, it's explicitly stated that if you carry out this mission, you will die as a martyr and be rewarded in the next mm-hmm. life. Yeah. Uh, and Japanese um, pilots, yep. yes. uh, uh, the kamikaze pilots in World War II. Mm-hmm. So the call to martyrdom in itself, if we elevate self-sacrifice to martyrdom, uh, that, that's a really interesting a phenomenon of of sacralizing something that is being requested and engineered by political power, perhaps sometimes, yes, uh, perhaps sometimes. What I'm uh, really starting to consider is, as you mentioned, that. I could feel in myself, you know, some some degree of wanting to push back of mm-hmm. no, 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 you know, um, I don't agree. Um, and that takes me sort of the, into the psychological realm of mm-hmm. people in our personal lives where we say, oh, you know, he or she is such a martyr. Of we We know we have an internal reaction that lets us know when we feel something is really noble, uh, something truly moves us, and when we feel manipulated. Mm -hmm. Well, but and before we go there, I just want to say that maybe maybe the takeaway here is that um, the religious function of the psyche can be manipulated. Mm Mm-hmm. And it can be manipulated by political forces. And, uh, you know, political, religious forces. Um, and, and so the question of, you know, 
to what are we in service right. is really, really right. important yeah. before we tie ourselves to the train tracks or whatever it is we're going to do. And, and is it in service to a reward? And your reward may be in heaven, uh, that in the afterlife you will, you know, accrue these kinds of benefits or life everlasting or whatever it is. Or is it purely uh, for the sake of something greater? Uh, is it purely a part of the religious function of the psyche? Or is it a transaction? If I do this, then I will get that. I don't think you can easily separate those things. I mean, do you think Thomas More didn't expect to go to heaven? You know, I I I I think that I think it's I think all of them, I think Thomas More, Sophie Schull, and the suicide bombers are all tapping into the same thing. And so I, this is complex. I, I agree that it's complex. Yeah. It's not it's not either or. Yeah. Um but you know, in the Christian belief and the Christian myth, you know, Jesus on the cross doesn't know. What's going to mm -hmm. happen? He feels mm -hmm. forsaken. Yes. Yep. And and so that puts it much more strongly in one domain than the yes. other. Yes. Yes. But sure, it's like a, a Venn diagram. There's mm -hmm. overlap. Lots. Yeah. Sometimes a lot of overlap. Yep. So Jung taps into this a little bit in volume eight, and I'll read a little bit of a quote there. There are all too many cases of men so possessed by a spirit that the man does not live any more, but only the spirit, and in a way that does not bring him a richer and fuller life, but only cripples him. I am far from implying that the death of a Christian martyr was a meaningless and purposeless act of destruction. On the contrary, such mm. a death can also mean a fuller life than any other. Rather, I refer to the spirit of certain sects which wholly deny life. And here he says, naturally, the strict Montanist view, which was a very, very ascetic um, group that he was very troubled by. And he goes on to say, which, in accord with the highest moral demands of the age, but it destroyed life all the same. What is it? to become of the spirit when it has exterminated man. I believe, therefore, that a spirit which accords with our highest ideals will find its limits set by life. And so Jung was grappling with a very similar question that sometimes there is a kind of spiritual force that can take hold of us, which can be a kind of colonizing that mm -hmm. here this mm. ascetic religion, which could be a political situation, could be a religion, could be some other kind of complex, kind of negative complex that can um, distort something inside of us that it becomes life denying, mm -hmm. that we are sacrificing yes. something mm -hmm. uh, perversely sacrificing something thinking yes. that we are in service to something that is great and exalted yep. only to find mm -hmm. out that it is a, a sham in the end. Yep. And, 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 and I think that's exactly, and I, I like what you said, Joseph, about how it's kind of against the life force. Mm -hmm. And how do we know? Like, do we know that, you know, how, how do we know which is which? I mean, I don't know that we do. I mean, we're sort of evaluating these different, you know, instances. But, uh, you know, who's to say whether or not it's a sham or it was legitimate? I think that's... What God are we serving? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like this uh, conflation of sacrifice, hero, martyr, mm -hmm. uh, and what is it really in service to? Of as you were saying, it's very uh, complex. And I think there is some way we 
we know mm -hmm. of the the image of that monk a flame affected us of yeah. uh, Thomas More has lived on in legend. Uh, other times we sort of tend to back off um, recognizing or just feeling in ourselves that this was a manipulation mm -hmm. or that this was a pointless sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, so s somewhere our feeling function uh, has a resonance uh, that helps us when we can't parse it all out cognitively. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Jung in that quote is giving us at least his perspective on it, which is, I believe, therefore, that a spirit which accords with our highest ideals will find its limits set by life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That we can surrender to something that has extraordinary ideals uh, of a religious nature or a political nature or a philosophic nature, but it's still, based on Jung's idea, should be set within the limits of life. And I think what he's saying is mm. it should not cause us to sacrifice our physical health or mm -hmm. our physical mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm which is also something that Buddha said. Yeah. Having um, indulged these paths of tremendous asceticism mm -hmm. and then coming back and saying, that was too much. Yeah. But I favor the middle path. Yep. As a way of reaching enlightenment. So, so um, y you know, you, you just made me think of another maybe, for maybe I think they thought they were martyrs, is... Um, the people in Jonestown. Oh. So they would have believed that, yeah. Yep. They, you know, so they were told, you know, give the Kool Aid to your kids first. And then, and they, you know, they thought they were dying for a higher cause. And, and so, you know, there might be some warning here of be really thoughtful about whether or not it's actually worth compromising your physical health. Uh, in service, to, you know what what's being asked of you, and and be be a little be a little bit uh, uh, skeptical mm -hmm. about what what's being asked of you. And, and maybe it comes to the question of what part of life are we required to sacrifice, or are we required to martyr? Mm -hmm. it, that it's metaphorical more than physical mm -hmm. you know do, do you really have to drink the kool-aid as they say is that what's really required o or is it facing something uh the death of a of a belief of something that cannot stand in the world something that i cared about and lived mm -hmm. and and i have to give that up Mm -hmm. which is very different from physical death. Mm -hmm. Which goes to this idea of the, the idea of the, the martyr being something that can be purely intrapsychic sometimes. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, the examples we're using are people that fully embodied the archetype and lived that out mm -hmm. you know, with their physical bodies. And there is a middle path again to live a life that mm. is purely ego driven, that it's just purely sensible. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. always adaptive is, yep. is also dull. Yes. There's something lifeless yes. about yes. it. That we do need something of the spirit. Yep. In order to, to make life worth living. And that can show up in terms of ideals or other relationships to the imagination. Mm -hmm. and that we need both. Both need to be in consultation with each other. Well, and, and again, that we have this need for meaning, Joseph. I think that's a great way to frame it. And But because of that, we're going to have a tendency towards zealotry. All of us have that <laughs> capability. And so we have to, like, like you said, sort of remain in dialogue around it. Like, where, 
where are we uh, sort of experiencing um, uh, spirit in a way that's sustaining and, and where are we perhaps being pulled into some darker manifestation of it? I wanted to share a quick quote from uh, Kierkegaard who says, the tyrant dies and his rule is over. The martyr dies and his rule begins. <laughs> uh -huh. so the martyr becomes a symbol in the collective. Yeah. So, so maybe we can switch over and, and talk a little bit about uh, the more colloquial meaning yes. of the term. I've been, is, I've been you, waiting to get see? there. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I've been thinking about how relational this whole concept of, of mm -hmm. martyrdom is, that it must be witnessed. Yep. It's a uh, performance. It's a, perfor it's a performance and a statement and a call in its best sense to a higher awareness, a higher consciousness. Uh, adherence to, as you're saying, the religious function mm -hmm. and a, a principle that is more valuable. And uh, oftentimes in personal life, um, being a martyr is a way of disparaging somebody. Of like, oh my God, uh, you know, this person is just such a such a martyr. Um, but that behind it often is a call on that person's part, the would-be martyr's part, to attention. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Uh, w witness what, what I am doing. Uh, um, please understand me. Uh, and that uh, beyond the, the sense of feeling irritated or manipulated that we can sometimes feel, uh, uh, is is the wish to be understood. Mm -hmm. But I think when we look at somebody and, uh, you know, I know when I can, you know, I feel a sense of resentment or something is being triangulated or it's chronic or something else, um, that that's what gives the person who's a martyr uh, sort of a negative, uh, feeling tone. Well, talk about the martyr complex. Mm -hmm. I think that we which uh, fair enough is sure. the martyr archetype and the historic martyrs. But the martyr complex are things we see in sitcoms, things we see uh -huh. in our personal yeah. lives. It's become really a colloquial pop psychology term, which of course deserves our our attention. And we're we're talking about a kind of character, and this is usually somebody who. Um, you know, uh, habitually sacrifices their desires and needs for the benefits of others, and in a way that's often, like you said, very visible, that they may present themselves as perpetual victims, and they're quietly suffering mm -hmm. the injustices or, or neglect. Not so quietly. <laughs> not so quietly. You know, the eors of our lives. Um, they often may use their sacrifices to uh, make other people feel guilty. Mm -hmm. And in, in that way, somehow being manipulative. So yes. They get a kind of emotional advantage. Mm -hmm. And just as both of you had said many times, a need for recognition, a deep seated mm -hmm. need to be acknowledged and appreciated. So, you know, the volunteer who says, Oh, of course I'll do that. You know, I, I, I didn't sleep for 30 hours in order to lick all the envelopes and make sure that they all went out. It was nothing at all. You know, I just, you know, I don't know why I just said that, you know. Um, but wanting that recognition that I, I've suffered greatly uh, to please, to serve, and uh, there is a, there's something gratifying about doing that and having it, it known. And I think it's the manipulative quality of that when we talk about it in terms of... Uh, mm -hmm popular psychology that really gets under our skin. Mm -hmm. That somebody's doing mm -hmm. something to us as they begin to, to shape themselves as being martyrs and particularly mm -hmm. being martyrs for us. Yeah. I'm yeah. your martyr, whether or not you like it. Mm -hmm. 
So Joseph, I'm going to go back to the word that you helpfully used really early on. You talked about how there's a certain kind of inflation and you even mm-hmm. said that for you, there was something protective about that in childhood. And, mm-hmm. um, but, but I, but I think, you know, the kind of collo- the colloquial sense of the term martyr, there, there is a kind of negative inflation. Like I've yeah. suffered more than anyone else. This is harder for me. And, and there's a certain kind of glorying in that. Mm-hmm. So it's related to the idea of the help-refusing complainer. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's someone says, well, I'm just so tired, and, you know, but I'll do it. And then some, well, well, I'll take that on. No, 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 it's okay, I'll do it, you know. So, <laughs> and it, it is, it is uh, there's, a, there's a certain enjo- reveling in, you know, how, how awful your situation is and making sure everyone else knows about it in some way. So there's also this wonderful expression, the tyranny of the weak. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that this, kind of, mm-hmm. this kind of martyrdom that we're talking about really has to do with claiming power indirectly. It's a, it's mm-hmm. an, it's a, it's a sort of subtle, backhanded way of trying to get power. I mean, the, the CEO of the company is rarely acting like a martyr. You mm-hmm. know, there's a, there's a way that that person can hold authority mm-hmm. and ask for what she wants and be very direct. The, but the martyr, it's like an unconscious uh, or semi-conscious uh, kind of sideways power play. And actually, uh, isn't that present? Um, in the other dimensions of of martyrdom that we have discussed, of of the Thomas More mm-hmm. could say, "I refuse to sign, and I am willing to die," and that is claiming a certain kind of power. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the the help rejecting complainer who says, "No, no, no. I'll you know I'll just I'll just suffer." Um, vocally over here, mm-hmm. uh, where we can sense the resentment and the and the anger, yep. you know, inherent in that situation, uh, and we have a very different reaction to it uh, than than we might have had had we been around when Thomas More was making his decision. Uh, that we sense that there's something manipulative, something covert. Uh, and we push back. Uh, you know, we say, okay, fine then. You, you know, you, you stay here after hours and, and finish licking all those envelopes. You know what I'm thinking of is that I'm, I'm thinking that um, but maybe both kind of martyrs are trying to evoke a certain response in the other person. Mm. Um, at least some of the time. I mean, certainly the the monk who self-immolated was was trying to change foreign policy in the rest of the world toward Vietnam. But I but I think the uh, the, the sort of passive aggressive martyr is is trying to uh, get a response to. I mean, I think like like I think it was you, Joseph, who talked about guilt, trying mm-hmm. to evoke guilt, not actually often trying to evoke real help. <laughs> right? Because then you might say, hey, do you have some time today to help me lick envelopes? You might just be direct about it. But you, you want some credit. You want attention. Um, and, and that's where the negative inflation comes in. And sometimes I think people do this because they've never had a straight shot to being admired or acknowledged. Somehow, because, maybe because of a cultural reason, that hasn't been super open to them. So then they have to do it in this kind of covert way, you know. Uh, so sometimes I think maybe, for example, women in a, in a more traditional culture uh, might, you know, especially women who were sort of born with like a lot of leadership capacity or something that's just thwarted because of life circumstances, that person might become a real martyr because there's some part of her that's trying to come into fullness an expression, but there isn't really a way. So it comes out in a kind of sideways way uh, where, you know, there's this, uh, there's this kind of covert expression of power and, and manipulation and trying to get something from the other person. So. No, I think the idea of guilt and particularly unconscious guilt, 
and how that plays into the martyr complex. Because when people are holding a massive amount of unconscious guilt, there's a way in which they're expiating that by putting themselves in situations that produce a tremendous amount of personal suffering to them. And through projective identification, the personal suffering that they're displaying will make the other person feel guilty Mm -hmm. so that it puts some guilt into the other person, which gives the martyr a sense of relief. And this kind of scenario, I think, is much more common than people realize. Mm. So it's a very sophisticated dance that's trying to relieve tension in multiple ways. I will orchestrate punishing myself in such a way that you will assume some guilt for it. Mm -hmm. And both the punishment and the projective identification create a temporary sense of relief Mm -hmm. in the person who's holding an enormous amount of unconscious guilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, another part of the dynamic maybe is like kind of not really taking full responsibility for yourself, right? So if you want help looking the envelopes, you don't say, gosh, I want help looking the envelopes. I better make sure I can get that somehow. And instead you, you, um, you kind of offload that responsibility onto those around you who then, and it's a double bind, right? Because they feel guilty, but there's no possible way that they can relieve your suffering because you're not going to let them. It's an interesting configuration. Because they need the personal suffering of licking 5,000 envelopes Mm -hmm. over 36 (laughs) hours to expiate something. And they also want you to feel bad about it so that they feel a relief in themselves. It's right. It's a very, very complicated dance and it's happening unconsciously. And we the person all know doesn't it. know. Yeah, yeah. We all we all know these people. We all I mean, I, I can acknowledge that sometimes I have a little bit of that, you know, that impulse to want to be the martyr. I can feel that in myself. And we've probably all done it at one time or another. And we probably know people who inveterately do it. And generally we just want to stay as far away as possible from them. Mm. You know, I think there's a connection with covert narcissism. And victimhood, Uh, you know, and the victim calls up uh, the opposite of of the abuser. You know, at first we may feel guilty, but then we tend to walk out of the room and then say, fine, keep licking the envelopes then. Uh, So now our our would-be martyr uh, is even more of a victim. Uh, and, and perhaps we feel guilty for for leaving them to it, um, but it's not honest emotionally. Yes, yeah, that's a great way of putting it's it. It's not. It's not honest. Mm-hmm. Of you know, of the the person is not able to say, "I want help" or "I want your attention." I want to feel cared for. Um, I don't feel valued. Uh, and so this this dynamic tends to just uh, perpetuate. It often is very chronic. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's, it's a like real a characterological kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, Here's, I'm I'm looking for kind of examples that are not or or that are not extraordinary. So I'm thinking about um, a particular client I had a number of years ago who was a single parent and uh, worked very, very long hours, um, felt really stressed, really exhausted. But deep down, he felt very, very guilty because he was not spending enough time with his son. And, and on a, right on the edge of consciousness, felt like he was, he was neglecting the child, although in an outer way, it was perfectly reasonable. He, he didn't earn a lot of money and needed to work as much as he did. Out of that guilt around not providing enough time for his son, mm-hmm. I think he started to um, not eat right. He lost an enormous amount of weight. Um, he would sometimes 
come into sessions um, looking gaunt, dark rings under his eyes. And at first I used to think, well, that, that maybe that's required in some strange mm. way by this abusive work situation he mm -hmm. was in. But I began to see that he was orchestrating this kind of self-punishing behavior. It took a long time for us to, to get to this sense of guilt that he had to add a level of punishment beyond the amount of work he was doing mm. because of feeling guilty uh, about his child. And then where things really started breaking down is his child started feeling incredibly guilty. And so, you know, his 10-year-old son was kind of desperately um, and anxiously trying to make amends as if he had done something wrong, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. constantly apologizing for everything in a way that was strange and odd. Mm -hmm. and, and so the feeling of guilt was actually beginning to rise up in his son mm -hmm. that the father was actually feeling for being neglectful. Well, you're, I think, uh, really lifting up the dynamics here or some of the dynamics and what can create uh, a martyr complex. Exactly. Is that a child can become parentified? Uh, that uh, if mom or dad uh, cannot provide the kind of of connection and attention that the child needs, the child can begin to uh, take the responsibility for the relationship and become pleasing. Of you know, so look, I cleaned I cleaned up the whole kitchen before you came home because I know you work so hard. Um, of look, I I'm doing this and I'm doing that, and that that can become deeply ingrained. That you have to earn love, you have to earn attention, you have to work for it, and that that can then become uh, your fictitious person who who stays up late licking envelopes and. Mm -hmm resents it because that's the part that never gets addressed is that that was a child once who deserved more parental time and attention than he or she got. You, you know, I think another way to think about this phenomenon is that the martyr looks selfless, mm. but actually is behaving in a way that's very selfish. Mm -hmm. because uh, the martyr makes a show of uh, performing a duty at great cost to him or herself. But because of the interpersonal manipulation, that person is using that display of selflessness to garner different rewards or attention. Uh, so there's, there's something... There's something about that that it looks mm -hmm. one it looks like one thing and it's actually another, and that's that's I think why it kind of irritates us all. But Deb, you make a good point that it's often often at the root of it, there there is um, there is the healthy impulse for for you know the the person wants something and doesn't know how to ask for it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm aware of a kind of heaviness that's landing into yeah. the conversation. Yeah. There's this yeah. kind of a, oh. It, you know. It's kind of a heavy topic. It's very heavy. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's the explicit pain when we're watching somebody martyr themselves, like that mm -hmm. devastating scene of the Buddhist monk. But even in the comedic scenes of the martyring mm -hmm. yes. grandmother or the martyring mother-in-law, <laughs> And people are irritated and all of that, but actually there is a there's a deep, dark, painful substrata. There's aggression and hostility in it. There can be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just wondering if if maybe we could, because I mentioned mm. it, but we, I, it would be interesting to pick it up. What's the relationship between? The, the martyr complex and covert narcissism. I 
I mean, <laughs> yeah. I can see that it can be. I, I don't know that it would be always that way. Right. But I can certainly see that there is one, someone does not have an adequate sense uh, of self mm -hmm. and, and cannot garner a sense of identity and positive um, self-image through a healthy channel. One could easily discover that inflicting some form of self-harm, some way of, of even inviting overwhelming adversity towards them could give them a sense of status and mm -hmm. a sense of false sense of identity. Mm -hmm. That's one way that I'm kind of playing it out of my mind. What, what I am thinking about is um, the, qual the relational quality, uh, the part that I was saying, um, it doesn't feel honest when we mm -hmm. feel manipulated, when there's resentment, of that, uh, that that is tied up with uh, a desire to be seen on the part of the covert narcissist or the, the would-be martyr. Uh, that that doesn't feel truly relational. It doesn't feel truly genuine. Uh, that there that um, the desire for admiration, the desire for acknowledgement, mm -hmm. um, and we feel manipulated into saying, "Oh gosh, you know, you licked all those envelopes, mm -hmm. all five thousand of them." Uh, we feel coerced. Yes, that's a good word. Uh, and that what is what is missing is um, relational satisfaction, um, a relational integrity, a, a relational connection. Uh, so it, it feels like an odd kind of dance that we've been coerced into the, the, and my guess is it goes way back into the seeds of that person's childhood and not being loved, celebrated, enjoyed mm -hmm. uh, just because you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, that should be the only requirement for a child is breathing. Mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. You're breathing and you're here and I enjoy you. Yeah. Uh, versus, uh, this is the child that it grows up to be uh, pleasing, that grows up to be uh, overly oriented toward toward doing, uh, who wasn't loved enough, and then as adults we feel like, ah, oh, you know, we we have to remember to say thank you to so and so for staying up until three in the morning mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't feel genuine. So we go in and we say, Oh my God, you did all that. That's really amazing. How could you do that? And that's not honest. Right. As what's really wanted is let's connect. Let's talk. What's happening here. Who are you? Mm. I, I don't want to play this game. You know, I'm just I'm just thinking about if we grew up with, let's say, a mother, and let's face it, it probably usually is more often women that develop mm. a martyr complex. If we had a mother who really had a martyr complex, mm. um, it it it's hard because in a way, she took up more emotional space than we did. Exactly. Even though it looked like she was doing everything for us and she was giving up everything for us, but, but really what was going on underneath the surface is uh, the whole system was oriented around mm -hmm. her emotional needs. So it, it can be kind of confusing. If, with the martyr and the narcissist uh, seeking sympathy and validation mm -hmm. by portraying themselves mm -hmm. as suffering, Yes. And self-sacrificing. Yes. And, and that is the neurotic suffering mm -hmm. that Jung talks about uh, 
over and over again and not the true suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's what we pick up when we're dealing with somebody who has a martyr complex. That's great, Deb, that it's, you know? that it's the neurotic suffering, and we just feel that. Yes. And I think we're also talking about this idea of emotional blackmail. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. And just that, you know, you have caused me so much suffering. You, you causing me, and, and, and that then you'll become compliant mm -hmm. in some way. So for the narcissist, you know, your supposed mistreatment of me is driven to gain control or to get attention. And then a little from a more martyring standpoint, you have caused me suffering as a way of getting compliance, you know, that you're going to, going to do what I need or, mm -hmm. or what I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this amplification of this um, perceived victimhood and mm -hmm. to then validate the need for special treatment and, and to manipulate how you're going to perceive me in the future. And that's definitely an intersection between those things, I think. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, Joseph. Uh, I'm also just thinking about how they're somewhat different as well. I think that um, with the covert narcissist that there's... Um, uh, actually, an inherent tension, though, because there's um, this internal self-perception of superiority, which is trying to assert itself, and yet in order to get that, they have to pretend to be vulnerable and inadequate. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's like an itch that doesn't get really <laughs> yeah. scratched, yep. satisfied. Um, for the in the martyr complex these public displays of suffering and sacrifice often um, more successfully feed a sense of righteous superiority for the suffering. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a little That's more part of it. Yes. congruence in the martyr and a little not quite fitting the bill for the narcissist. Yeah, yeah. But that's the you, you raised that really good point that, that martyrdom does always come with a sense of righteousness. Inherently. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And, and, and again, that's, that, that's maybe like whether or not you're talking about the kind of, um, you know, traditional meaning of the, of the word or the colloquial meaning we've been talking about, that, that little sense of self-righteousness, that's always, that should always make you pause. If you're feeling self-righteous, you should maybe just insert a pause and do some self-reflection because we can get carried away back to inflation. Yeah. I mean, I think self-righteousness often goes along with inflation. And criticism is also a part that the covert narcissist is very excruciatingly sensitive to criticism. So the, the self-sacrifice has to um, increase the status in some way. Mm -hmm. While for the martyr, um, having criticism heaped upon them can actually be used as further proof of their martyrdom and yeah. actually reinforce the inflation. Well, of course you would criticize me. Pontius Pilate didn't like me either. <laughs> um, so being reviled yes. um, feeds the martyr complex, but being reviled mm -hmm. is a terrible, excruciating experience for the narcissist. Mm -hmm. so, so it seems to me I've been thinking about, you know, how does this tie in with uh, the religious uh, function mm -hmm. of there's the martyr complex at one end of the spectrum, and then you know the Thomas Moores uh, at the other end of the spectrum. And I'm thinking that martyrdom and the sacrifice, uh, literally, of one's life in the extreme, should result in higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that that is, you know, certainly what happened with uh, Jesus on the cross, with Thomas More, with, you know, a number of examples that we could cite of people go, oh my gosh, uh, this was for something greater. And it inspires uh, from the martyr's sense of consciousness, of realization. 
uh, values, connection with something spiritual uh, versus something that is just a, a chronic thing that feels uh, kind of awful, feels mm -hmm. like we're being manipulated. It's tinged with uh, resentment or a sense of being coerced. But it should, we should be hoping for a transformation of consciousness mm -hmm. that this martyrdom elevated us. We see it differently. I get it. There's something greater. Hmm. Well, that feels like a good summation, Deb. And maybe hmm. that's our final word on this topic, at least for now. And we can switch over to a dream. Okay. We certainly. Before we switch to a dream, I just want to let everyone know about our Patreon. We offer uh, four, uh, basically every week, we offer a sort of little mini episode. Uh, it's either we either take a question from a listener or we interpret a dream from a, from a patron, excuse me, a patron. So if you can't get enough of This Jungian Life and you need a little more, <laughs> go on over to our website, thisjungianlife.com, that if you click on podcast at the top, one of the options on the drop-down menu is become a patron, or you can look, look us up on patreon.com and you can give us, uh, you know, support us for, uh, you know, as little as $1 a month, and uh, that will help us keep the lights on. So maybe take a look at that. Okay, let us move into a dream. And this week's dreamer is a woman who is 40 years old. And um, I'm imagining she's British because she says, I'm a full-time mum, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is uh, really charming. Okay, the title of her dream is Pine Needle Elixir for Men. And here's the dream. I possess some kind of potent male elixir for health. It is a sticky clear syrup made from pine needles. I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm being interviewed, or it's the first day of a new job, a job I'm not sure I want, but because I have this elixir, I have applied and am right for it. My new boss, a woman, is showing me around. She's not the kind of woman I connect with, maybe a career woman in a cheap suit or sportswear running a place for men, a gym or a male health center. I don't think my boss knows I have this elixir. I'm waiting until she's done showing me around to present it. I'm pretending to be interested, but I know I just want to present the elixir and be done with it. I'm not interested in this place. I'm not sure how to use the elixir or really anything about it. As soon as I have the opportunity to start the job, I start asking questions about it to my new boss. Is it safe? What should I say about it? I don't want to make false claims. I possess this elixir kind of reluctantly. I have a vague sense that it may need to be administered through a blowjob. I really don't want to have to do that to all the men here and feel dread about it. I think of the possibility of catching a disease if I have to give a blowjob to that many men. I hope there's another way to take it and that I can just offer it and allow the men to administer the elixir to themselves if they want. I really don't want to be much a part of it. There's a sense that I'd rather not have to be involved in all this, but it's made me an opportunity, uh, my duty as possessor of this elixir. Question mark. And for comments, she says, uh, the context is, I have just turned 40, what seems like a, a significant transition. I'm trying to figure out who I am again after a lifetime of not listening to my needs and desires and really trying to turn the tide and figure out what is next for me in this new stage of life. I desire a more potent relationship with my creativity and I'm doing what I can to carve small moments for creativity amongst the demands for mother, of motherhood. 
I have also been trying to be more present as I am often overtaken by thought and doing and often feel alienated from my body. After a period of two years of very depleted sleep, I recently reclaimed the night for myself and am finally starting to get sleep. I wish it hadn't taken me so long to make this change. The main feelings in the dream, she says, are feeling like I just wanted to pass this elixir on so it could be used. I felt no power possessing it and really didn't want to demand that I get on my knees to administer it. There was a detachment from what was happening, the job I now had, and what it might demand of me. And for additional context, the dreamer says, The environment of the gym or male health center reminds me of my first job, a place I worked in at weekends when I was 15. It was a bodybuilding gym, and I really didn't like it much and all the people who worked there. They hired me because I was pretty and young, and the men liked to see me on the reception. The woman that ran it was a female bodybuilder, and she had a bodybuilding husband. To me, they were ugly, vain, boring, full of steroids, and not very nice people. This world lacked creativity, culture, beauty style, intellect, all the things that I was interested in. So I have to say that um, when I was picking dreams this morning before uh, we recorded and I saw this one, I thought, Oh, I thought Joseph is going to have a lot to say about this dream. <laughs> Can't imagine why. <laughs> oh, oh, me either. <laughs> okay. But, but where I want to start is the difference between what's actually happening in the dream and the amount of fantasy material that the dream ego introduces. Mm-hmm. Because the dream itself doesn't have an awful lot to the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is full of an awful lot of fear and assumptions on mm-hmm. the dream ego side, which probably have to be confronted. Well, if we begin right at the beginning, mm-hmm. first of all, there's the title of the dream, and I think she titled it An Elixir for Men or something? Pine, pine, pine needle. needle elixir for men. So I'm I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Joseph attack the pine needles because I know where you're gonna go with that. Uh, no, please. Oh, you do? Because I don't. I, I'm not sure. At <laughs> least go for it's, it. It's well. I mean, we'll get there. But I'm thinking of the myth of Addis. Could be. Okay. But, but I but I actually wanted to start with this um this word elixir because I looked mm-hmm. it up. It's used throughout the dream and. It, and, and here are the synonyms. Again, this is Merriam-Webster. A substance held capable of changing base metals into gold, mm-hmm. which is the same thing as the alchemical philosopher's stone. And it's a substance held capable of prolonging life indefinitely uh, or a cure-all. So it is, it, it's the sort of magical thing that transforms. And I, I, I mean, here's my, my little first pass on this dream, I guess. I I'm um I thought that the new boss who uh the the dream ego seems to have some disdain for you know that that she's she's a career woman in a cheap suit or something not yeah. not my kind of person it's like well when the dream ego has disdain for a same sex figure it's like okay shadow right so her shadow is a female boss. And it, it mirrors a little bit this experience that she had when she was younger of working in this bodybuilding gym. And she says, you know, I, I didn't like this couple there. It's not, you know, they're not, what were some of the um, adjectives? They, they were vain. Vain, uh, lack, lacked uh, creativity, culture, style, beauty, intellect. Yes, I'm sure it's true. But again, what are the values that are ego syntonic or are embraced by the ego? So we can imagine that this woman embraces creativity, culture, style, beauty, intellect. But then the shadow is what are the qualities that are ego dystonic or that are rejected by the ego? And here it's power. It's power that is rejected by the ego, whether it's the power of the bodybuilder, 
um, and uh, you know, and um, or the the boss as the dream figure, the boss in the cheap suit. Um, you know, she has power, and this this dream ego feels kind of disdainful of it. So I have a feeling that her own power and effectiveness is somewhat in the shadow for her. But she has the elixir. She has the thing that can transform it. And she knows that she needs it because in her associations, she said, I desire a more potent relationship with my creativity. Mm -hmm. So she, she even used that word, you know, potent comes from same similar uh, root as power, potency. The, the storyline that I'm kind of tracking in the dream is the storyline of being one down. Mm -hmm. she, our dream ego is the one with the elixir. She's yeah. got, she has the power. She's got the stuff. But as the dream wends its way along, uh, the way that it's administered, it's as if she has to administer it, and she has to administer it by giving these men blowjobs. Instead of being able to use it herself. Mm -hmm. yeah. for, and what I thought of mythologically is uh, the, the myth of uh, Psyche and Eros, where uh, Psyche is um, living with and kind of married to the god Eros, and Psyche is a human woman. And she dares to look upon him, and in so doing, spills hot wax on him. Uh, and off he goes. Um, he's out of there. And Psyche then has to do all these tasks uh, to earn uh, her, her way back to uh, civilization and, and favor. And her very last task is to go into Hades and get Persephone's beauty box to give to Aphrodite, her mother-in-law. And after she literally goes all the way to hell and back and gets mm -hmm. the beauty box, something wakes up in her, and it's as if her internal dialogue is, hey, I did all the work. I'm the one that got the special beauty box. What am I going to give it to you for? Right. I want this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm looking for uh, in the dream, is that place of turnaround that doesn't happen uh, in, in this right. dream. Of, it's my elixir. I've got it. I want to use it for my own uh, advancement and growth. Yes. But I, but I want to say that the thing about the blowjob is so interesting, right? Uh -huh. Because that would be a very weird way to administer a medication. Because <laughs> actually what happens in a blowjob is you, take, you ingest something. You don't put something yes. into someone. Right. And she even says somewhere, I was looking, you know, that she would sort of have to go down on her knees. Yes. So there's something about um, being receptive to the masculine principle, Right. So it, it, she doesn't want to do that, or she's worried that it's going to make her ill. But but I think in some sense that's what's needed, not to not to be you know uh, um, subject to men, but to be to to be to to sort of be open to the masculine principle that that somehow I think that if she gave all those men the blowjobs, in some sense that would be the elixir and. I'm, Obviously, this is the fanciful language of the dream, not not a literal uh, suggestion. But but it's interesting that the dream ego is a little bit like, no, I don't want to do that. But that might be what is required to to take in this the masculine for the force, the forcefulness of the masculine, which she started to do by reclaiming the night so that she can begin to sleep. Hmm. <laughs> no, we're waiting for you, Joseph. <laughs> You're looking so thoughtful. <laughs> it's just that the, the dream is um, the dream is 
full of so much um, resentment. Yeah. The dream is just full of resentment. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like the, um, the action of the dream is so small. It's so bare yeah. bones, but it's all slathered with resentment, which makes me wonder how much of the very basic structure of her life is is slathered or plastered with resentment, which makes it so unclear how to orient to things. So if I just look at the facts of the dream, I have pine syrup, I interview for a job, a woman shows me around, I ask questions about the syrup. That, that's, all, that's the only action of the dream. Mm-hmm. Everything else is this kind of resentful subtext that she is introducing, the dream ego is introducing into the process. Is it an elixir? How does she know it's an elixir? She knows nothing about it. She has a fantasy that it's an elixir, but she's asking questions because she doesn't know if it's an elixir. She wants to think it is. Is this a job? Has she been hired? Is this woman asking her to do anything? She's already decided she doesn't want to do anything. She doesn't even want to be there. But nobody's asked her to be there. Nobody's asked her to do anything. She doesn't even know that it's a medicament. No pun intended. Um, Or that it's going to have any kind of positive effect. And she's fantasizing about giving blowjobs to some grand number of guys in this gym as she is saying, well, I don't want to have to do that, but I can't stop myself from thinking about it. Well, who's the one who's thinking about all those dicks? <laughs> no, no one, the dream maker isn't whipping all those dicks out and waving them at her. <laughs> There's not an army of men with erections all standing looking at her expectantly for healing. She's the one who's fantasizing about providing blowjobs to some army of expectant men who will interpret this as a healing process. And then the ego says, but I don't want to do that. But the ego is the one who's generating the fantasy. Mm -hmm. So what I hear in the dream is a classic neurosis that the things that I'm fantasizing about are the things that are not allowed, or the things that I'm considering are the things that I'm also attacking. But the dream is very simple. You have some syrup, you don't know what it's for, and you could ask some questions about what it's for. And all the other intrusive dynamics of whether or not you have to be on your knees or whether or not you have to service armies of men or whether or not you're an employee or you should take the job or not take the job are totally irrelevant. The question is, what's the syrup? What's it good for? And do you care about that in any particular way? So to me, there's such an intrusion of neurotic material into something that is is actually of just a simple inquiry. If we take this to her creativity, you have a creative impulse. How complicated are you making it? And we see this all the time. Somebody, let's say, who's been an accountant, they wake up and they want to, you know, they think, God, I'd love to learn how to paint. My -hmm. goodness the machinations they often have to go through to get themselves to a painting class. Well, what if I'm not any good? What if people shame me? I have to be perfect. Uh, And then there's this. Where am I going to get the time? I really shouldn't do that, but I could do this. Should it be acrylic? Should it be (laughs) ink pastels, oil pastels? Maybe I should do pen and ink. And this kind of mountain of stuff Hmm. accretes around something that is so simple. You know, my friend. If you wish to learn to paint, sign up for a class. Learn how to paint. But this, you know, tidal wave of complications and distress and this intrusion of my self-esteem and whether or not somebody thought I would paint a good picture when I was in first grade. So all the neurotic material interferes massively into some 
and this is true about all of us, by the way, interferes in something which is perhaps a very simple inquiry about a little thing and what it may or may not mean. So my first um, curiosity would be to look up what pine syrup is good for Hmm. Mm -hmm. or not good for, Mm -hmm. just in the kind of an herbal compendium. Mm. <laughs> and just and just start there and try to get a sense of how the medicine might be useful, as you were both saying, for her. Yeah. Yeah. What is pine syrup good for? And and it's like she has the power, but she wants to disavow it. You know, she has and Deb, I yeah. think this is kind of where you were going, you know, she says, um, you know, I really don't want to be a part of it. You know, I'd rather not be involved, you know. So she, she, she wants to kind of distance herself from it, but she has the power. And, you know, what I'll say is that I'm guessing that her child is young because she talks about sort of not sleeping. Does she, does she actually give the child's age? But no. anyway, been there and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's horrific. And it is that period, it's, it is very difficult to kind of claim your own power because right. you, you do need to be in service to this young child, which can be, uh, what I meant is sleep disturbance can be horrific. Being the parent of a young child can be many things, including <laughs> delicious. But the sleep disturbance is really hard. And, you know, it could be that she's at this part of her journey where she needs to claim the potency of that potion, yeah. You know, I will say, you know, having uh, having been a woman, and, and <laughs> as far as you, as far as far as we know, you still are. <laughs> and uh, ha- having been the mother of young children, I I can appreciate the dilemma that many women and mothers uh, are in of having to use your power on behalf of your needy child, baby, toddler, child, children, of the, that you have to put other people first. And it can lead to a terrible dilemma about to what extent can I use my own power for my own self and uh, you know, like your example, Joseph, of can I just go take a painting class? Oh, no, because that will be using resources and time for something frivolous and something that's just for me when I really should be serving my children and my family and so on and so forth. Uh, so I can appreciate the dilemma of, uh, of women, especially mothers, who who have to use their power on behalf of others so much of the time. Yeah. And then uh, it makes using your power for yourself, you know, feel, feel forbidden, feel, yeah, exactly. feel, feel selfish, as if it's a zero-sum game, and the more I take for myself, the less there's going to be for other people, which is not true. Mm-hmm. It's true to some extent. Um, but it's a real dilemma. Yeah. Yes. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.